no, I think we, we should now be live on Facebook as well as on Click Meeting. Okay. So, good evening, everybody, to uh, a later start tonight. Um, and welcome to another question and answer session with the PBC Foundation. Obviously, with uh, presented by Colette, our CEO, and tonight our guest medic is Dr. Andrew Yeoman. Thank so, you very I hope, much, Alan. <laughs> I hope you all have a very good uh, good evening and an interesting and informative session. And I will Thank catch you. up with you later. Thank right, you. Right, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. I know this has been uh, quite a faff, as you say, in Scotland, but we're very, very grateful. And thank you to everybody. I see we've got some people in the room. And we'll have people on Facebook who I can't see. But I do have staff behind the scenes who are messaging me your questions. And, uh, you know, Robert will be there watching, just checking that everything's OK. Robert's doing well, by the way, everybody. And he sends his best. And he's been amazing with the handover. Uh, he's been very, very good. Right. So, do you know, I I need new glasses, so we're just going to have to go with this. Right. Brilliant first question. Can you tell me a person who is vegan? Uh, <laughs> yes, it should be. It's, it's a, um, Urso is synthetically produced now. Um, I think um, where it probably throws people is um, it's called Urso because it was first, uh, Urso deoxycholic acid was first discovered in bear bile. Um, and so uh, the Latin for bear is ursine, so that's where the name Urso comes from, but it's all synthetically produced now, so it's, it should be vegan. Yeah, yeah, so there you go, because we do get asked this, does it have any animal additives? I could have told you that, but I'm not as clever as Andy, I just would have thought it. Um, so would a low carb, high fat, moderate protein diet be good or bad for you? Can I just come on in this in a wee minute? May I say something, Andrew, on this? Listen Absolutely. to me, everybody. Just listen to me. If you want to take something out of your diet, take out sugar. Okay? It's one of the most disgusting, poisonous substances on this earth. You know, you see with diets, low carb, high fat, all these things, you know, some people have some success for some of the time. We, and Andy might say something different, we advocate, you know, good, um, wholesome diet, as little processed food as possible. Just keep an eye on the refined carbohydrates, the sugars and cakes and sweets and things. And, you know, and then have a wee bit of what you fancy. Um, but it's the processed foods, um, the white rice, the white pasta, you know, that the, they've had their vitamins stripped out of them. And, and just, you know, keep a nice, sensible diet and try not to miss things out, particularly if you fancy a wee something. I, I, unless, you know, somebody's seriously ill with... Uh, decompensated uh, liver disease then you know dietitians will come into it what do, what do you feel about this Andrew? yeah i mean i think we we get asked a lot of question of, uh, about um about diets and i think you know what you're describing there the low carb the high fat um yeah. this is a, some people call them paleo diets some people you know, the atkins diet is a version of low carb high fat what's really interesting about things like Atkins and paleo is that if you have more fat in your diet, you get full quicker and you actually ingest less carry calories. So the reason those diets work by reducing your weight is you just eat less calories. You take in less. Mm -hmm. So it's ultimately there, there are healthier ways of taking in less calories. So what you're doing really with the fat is you're tricking your brain that you're fuller than you actually are. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, as we know with um, PBC, it can lead to disordered lipid, you know, or fat metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly, you know, as time goes on and as you get older anyway, where you're more likely to have more high levels of bad cholesterol, a high mm -hmm. fat diet isn't necessarily a good thing to have. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so long term, the, the, the safety of these very high fat, low carb diets has not been established. And I think if you've got a condition where you can get disordered fat or lipid metabolism, mm -hmm. I, I don't recommend them long term. They can be useful to, to get people started off, you yeah. know, in terms of make, making that early change. But as you say, it's cut mm -hmm. out the junk, cut out yeah. the junk, cut out the hyper processed stuff and the complex mm -hmm. carbohydrates. And actually, over time, you, you will lose weight in a far more safe and effective way. Yeah, and you don't want to be losing tons all at once, but it's and the psychological thing if you cut something out, you want it all the more, I think, for human yeah. beings, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've lost a stack of weight since June, I've lost about two and a half stone now, but yeah. I've stopped doing all those diets, I've stopped it. I've just that, that I was on like a lot of people on the treadmill, 
and I've just yeah. stopped it and I'm watching my calories and I practice movement as medicine as well. And I've got we weight as well, tins of beans, right? That's what we do, tins of beans. I uh, would thank you for that, Andrew. So uh, this person says, newly diagnosed PBC and medication scans, all sorted. I'm checking my blood test. I noticed that RO minus 52 test is positive. Can you advise me if this is definitely the test for Sjogren's syndrome and if I would need to be seen by somebody else other than a gastro, as nobody has mentioned this result to me? Okay, yeah. So um, when we look at the antibodies in people with autoimmune diseases, obviously we look for the anti-mitochondrial antibody in PBC, but there are other antibodies that we can measure for. The important thing with these is that if you measure these tests in everybody, if you just took a random selection of people, you will find some of these antibodies in people who don't have those conditions. OK, yeah. um, and not everybody with a raised AMA has PBC at, at this point in time, but although they may well develop it in the future. So it all depends on the context. And in other words, what are your symptoms? If you're suffering from joint pains and joint aches and you have uh, Rho or La uh, antibodies in your blood, then you may well have Sjogren's syndrome, and it would be appropriate to have a, a review with a with a rheumatologist to, to to sort of to see if your treatment needs to be modified. But if you haven't got joint symptoms, you will see these antibodies in people's bloods whether they've got PBC or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think symptoms and relating the antibodies to symptoms and the other clinical findings are really really important. Mm -hmm. If, if if you this person, if you do have dry eyes and dry mouth, which is quite quite common, yeah. lots and lots of people don't test for Sjogren's. This came up with Professor yeah. Newberg weeks ago. Um, but be very mindful, keep your eyes moist. I usually go, there's my wee thing here. This is one of the new um eye things. This is Fabby, right? Not like the old rubbish they had in the old days. He's really, really good. Keep your eyes moist. You have yeah. two sets of tears, one to make you cry when you're out in the wind. And the other, when you close your eye and open it, it cleans them. And that's what we um, kind of don't have enough of sometimes or have any at all. So keep your eyes moist. And I would say to you with, with your mouth as well, try, you know, uh, should be chewing gum or if you're not that kind of thing, check with your dentist. There's things you can have. What not to do is these chemical mouthwashes. Be very careful of those. I said this before, and James Newberg checked with his dentist, and he's, the dentist says, yeah, your lady's quite correct. Because these these chemicals in your mouth, they can dry them out further, and they stain your teeth, and they can start, distort the taste of your food. So do not use chemical mouthwashes. Keep your mouth fresh. And cleansing, apart from toothpaste, is warm salt water. Granny said so, and Granny's got it right. It's a great antiseptic and anaesthetic as well. Fair dues. Yeah, no, fair dues. And I think the other thing is, Sjogren, some people have joint symptoms and the dry eyes, dry mouth. Some people just get joint symptoms. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got those antibodies or not, but if you're having dry eyes, you can you can still have that complication of yeah. autoimmune diseases. So yeah. um, the antibodies are not always present in either Sjogren's mm -hmm. with the joint symptoms or the dry eyes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this question, this next question, thank you, it comes up a huge amount. So, is it possible to find if I can take a bog standard multivitamin uh, plus mineral? My diet is okay, but I think I'm lacking in certain bits and bobs. Okay. I'd like to go uh, into winter knowing I'm strong. I've tried getting hold of my consultant, but he's on his holiday. So, any guidance would uh, be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think supplementation is an interesting one, isn't it? And I think. Um, mm. If you have a good, a healthy, balanced diet, you probably aren't lacking in anything major. The one, the one exception to that is vitamin D. Yeah. Um, so, so, we, so we live in a in a very sun poor country, um, mm -hmm. and I mean I'm talking about the UK here. So apologies if you live in the US and you live in in warmer climes. Good <laughs> luck to you. Uh, I think Mona's mm -hmm. from the US, isn't she? So, um, she is, but, yeah. but, but but certainly um, certainly um, Nice recommends vitamin D supplementation for all adults in the UK in yeah. in uh, in the winter months and i, I think it's, it's also a lower threshold if you have dark skin so so if you uh, if you are of uh, asian ancestry or afro-caribbean ancestry and you have darker skin then vitamin d supplementation can definitely be be helpful in making you feel uh, a, a bit stronger uh, less mm. bone and joint pains and things like that but in terms of routine supplementation if you have a balanced diet you shouldn't need to however if you do want to supplement that just go for a very bog standard multivitamin. It doesn't be anything fancy. Don't buy anything expensive. There's a lot of expensive uh, snake oil out there. You just need to get the cheapest multivitamin you can get. Uh, and it needs to be low dose. So we don't recommend high doses of anything. 
Um, mm. So as an example, high dose vitamin A can be very, very toxic to your liver. But if you go and get uh, sort of Centrum or sort of Boots Own brands and multivitamins, they're not going to harm you. But if you have a good balanced diet, you know, plenty of fruit yeah. and vegetables, um, cereals in your diet, things like that, you shouldn't really be wanting for anything that a multivitamin will make you feel any better, with the except exception of vitamin D, particularly in winter. Yeah, yeah, vitamin D is the one. As you see in this country, particularly Scotland, but anyway, there we go. Now, this question comes from Welsh. I had a lovely Welsh accent swimming around our living room last night while I was speaking to this lady. So she's uh, at our so has lowered her ALT and her AST. Okay. And it's been a slow and fluctuating three years since I started medica medication. Due to that, the doctor's thinking of adding additional medication. Now my ALT and AST sit just outside the normal range. Is it better for optimal health for the liver to sit in the normal range? Uh, common sense says it would be, but can the liver withstand ranges outside the normal range? I'm 37, so got quite a few years ahead, which she has indeed. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. a great question. It's a great yeah, question. Yeah, I so, said that to you last night. Yeah. Yeah, that's a super question. So th there's a lot to unpack in that. So yeah. the, the first thing to say that the enzymes that have been referenced in that question are not always abnormal in people with PBC. Mm -hmm. um, so ALT and AST enzymes are, are more typically elevated in autoimmune conditions like autoimmune hepatitis rather than PBC. Mm -hmm. Although some people with PBC have elevations in those enzymes. And actually, interestingly, it tends to particularly affect younger people with PBC and mm -hmm. probably a little bit more likely to have those enzymes elevated. When those enzymes are elevated rather than the alkaline phosphatase, which is the classical enzyme that goes up in PBC, it's always important to consider the possibility of the overlap syndromes or the variant syndromes that people sometimes talk about, where you can have PSC slash autoimmune hepatitis. So that's something to have a discussion with your doctor about. Um, if they think that the, those enzymes are elevated solely related to um, to PBC, then th yes, if they aren't normalized, we would try to normalize them. Um, because in general, and this is a general term, if you have a normal liver enzyme level, um, you're less likely to have inflammation in your, lab, uh, in your liver and therefore you're less likely to progress in terms of scar tissue in your liver. Now, mm -hmm. the other bit that's interesting to unpack with that sort of question is that in terms of the question is, is can your liver tolerate inflammation? The answer is yes. Not everybody with PBC develops advanced liver disease, cirrhosis and complications of cirrhosis. Um, those things are genetically determined and in a different way to whether you'll get PBC or any other liver condition or not. So some people will get lots of inflammation, but no scar tissue as a result. And if you're fortunate enough to be one of those people, then even a slightly elevated ALT or AST level won't matter as much as if you're as if you're somebody who is prone to developing the, lots of scar tissue. The challenge we have as doctors and, and how we can sort of inform you as patients is that we don't know at the beginning when you're first diagnosed whether you're somebody who forms scar tissue or not. Um, yeah. Only if you do a biopsy or only if you've got a fibre scan or if you've, or you've already identified cirrhosis can we tell if you've already got scar tissue. But if you haven't got it and you're young, 37 is, is very young, um, then we, we can't know whether you're likely to develop it over time. So the preference would always be to try and get the liver tests into the normal range to, to reduce the chances of you developing scar tissue in the future. So it's a long answer no. to, a, to a really good question. And I hope a cracker. Well, she's not finished. She's Welsh, you know, she's got more here. <laughs> Over the five years <laughs> having BBC, yep. swine flu, it came about swine flu, which I swine flu giving birth, <laughs> hence why I know my blood work um, with the swine flu. My red cell distribution width has increased slightly over the years and now outside the normal range. Okay. Could you explain more on the importance of monitoring red cell distribu distribution width, please? That's I wasn't expecting to get that on liver forum, I have to say. So that's another great... No, I, I, I have no idea about this at all. That's so. fine. So first of all, an explainer, okay? What is red cell distribution width, okay? So red red blood cells are what carry hemoglobin which is the bit that carries oxygen around your body okay so it's obviously very important now the red cell distribution width is a very fancy way of looking at a certain property of our red blood cells namely how big they are okay and there's certain conditions make your red cells bigger or smaller and the classic situation and the only really clinically important one is in relation to anemia so a lack of hemoglobin a lack of red blood cells 
And what happens in certain types of anemia um, is that your red cells get bigger or smaller. Um, but irrespective of what the individual red blood, blood cell size is, there's a bigger variation. And if the variation in the different sizes of the red blood cells is greater, that's what's called a, an increase in the red cell due to distribution width. So it just basically means if the distribution width increases, that means that the red cells are of a greater range of size. Normally speaking, the cell should be a fairly um, tight range of size. Um, so they normally vary between 80 to 100, I think it's microns, but, um, but certainly it's normally quite tightly ranged. But if you're lacking in iron, for example, then that can increase. So the important thing is if your red cell distribution width increases, you need to look for um, deficiencies in iron, vitamin B12, folate, things that can cause anemia or deficiencies and the way that hemoglobin uh, works and is produced and the red blood cells uh, are in terms of their size. Mm -hmm. um, it can also increase in acute bleeding, but that's not something you'd expect to see in this situation. But if somebody yeah. had, uh, had a bleed from their gut or bleed from uh, major trauma, uh, but th that that's something that would be very very noticeable the mm. other important thing to say is that red cell distribution width does vary naturally and so in mm. many people if you're not anemic and you're not lacking in vitamin b12 folate uh, and uh, and iron then it's almost certainly nothing to worry about okay fantastic didn't understand a word of it but that's fine it's above my pain. sorry it was a <laughs> no i i think you did that actually very well i do know a little, a little bit um uh, I just for other reasons. Anyway, now, can you let me know if you can take Urso and Ox bile together? I'm an Urso responder and have no gallbladder. I don't know what Ox bile is. One word, O X B I L E. Um, I'm not sure. Is is that a is that an over the counter? I don't know. Right. Okay. Whoever sent um, in that question, maybe a bit more detail. Could we have? Yeah. A, a general point around that is, uh, I think you know. If you're on prescri prescription medications, it's always important that you have a conversation with your healthcare professional about other things you're taking over the counter. Not because mm -hmm. we're there to always stop you taking them. Some of them are perfectly fine and safe to take, like low dose multivitamins, for example. Oh. But it's just sometimes some of these things can have liver related reactions. Some of them are not as well tested as they should be those put off the internet so it's just a bit of a caution with those things yeah it sounds like it might be one of these synthetic bios a, a bit like what urso is itself but but in general i think it you know i i would advocate for the tried and tested we know oh, urso is safe and we yeah. know what to do if it works yeah. carry on with it if it doesn't work yeah. we have other licensed well tested medications to use yeah. so my general plea would be to stick to the tried and tested that have gone yeah. through rigorous trials or other things which which may be of slightly iffy providence. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say, and whoever has asked that question, thank you for that. But it's also fair to say that it's maybe worth asking your own doctor because he knows your whole medical medical history. Uh, a nice question on the screen here, when I have an ultrasound scan, I have to fast beforehand. Twice, yep. I, twice I'd forgotten by the way, but that's fine. Do I need to fast before a fibre scan? Good question. Yeah, good question. So, so, um, Worth probably just exploring briefly why we ask people to, to fast for, for an ordinary ultrasound scan. It's not to look at the liver as much as to look at the gallbladder, okay? Yeah. So what happens is, is the gallbladder contracts in response to meals. And so if the gallbladder is contracted at the time of a scan, then it can look overly thickened and that might concern us. And then we also sort of go, oh, the gallbladder is thickened, that could be abnormal, but whereas actually it's just because you've eaten. So in order to have a good view of the gallbladder, it's best to be fasted. So that's for a traditional ultrasound. Um, it is in general better to be fasted for a fibre scan for about three hours. OK, um, the reason for that is that fibre scan measures the property of stiffness of the liver. OK, and we use how stiff the liver is as what we call a surrogate, an indirect marker of how hard the liver is and therefore whether there's scarring there or not. Now, if you've had a meal, the liver blood flow is increased because the gut's very active. It's sending lots of chemicals to the liver to be processed and the blood flow does increase slightly. And so in some people after, you know, recent meals and certainly the larger the meal, the greater the, the effect that can sometimes falsely elevate the fibre scan score and give us, you know, a, a reading that is perhaps higher than there would otherwise be if, if it was fasted. So in, in general, go in fasted if you can and you're, you're more likely to get an accurate reading because you're not measuring then an increase in liver blood flow, making the liver a little bit mm -hmm. stiff. Got a nice message on the screen from our, our Welsh lady. I have a history of anemia, so that to do with the red cell. So there you go. I would stay in medicine, Andrew. 
And <laughs> Dio, 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 D I O L C H. Diog, yes. Diog. Yeah. my husband said. She even spoke to my husband. She didn't believe I was married to a Welshman. She spoke to him too. <laughs> and you're very welcome anyway. You're very welcome indeed. Yeah. Now, um, this this next question is more than one question, but it, it, there's a slight concern here. She says, this person says, I'm suffering with numbness and the tops of my feet. And then goes on to say, can't lose weight. Stage four vitamin V, D, uh, vit stage four PVC. Vitamin D tends to stay low. Should I use Goli gel supplement? And what about CBD or medicinal marijuana? And I mean Goli gummies, apple cider vinegar. I'm going to say to this person that um, the vitamin D, if your vitamin C is low, then you need to talk to your doctor about um, giving you supplements for d vitamin D. Um, the supplements that you discuss um, is not... And if they've not tried and tested, I'm not sure that any medical doctor in the United Kingdom would, would want to comment on them. Um, but I think there's concern here with the, the numbness and the weight, Andrew. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, certainly, uh, I think we always have to, I'm always very skeptical in terms of the, the, the fact mm -hmm. is that most um, non-licensed supplements are untested and, and so therefore mm -hmm. of a very dubious efficacy so generally speaking if something shows promise from a mechanism point of view that will improve a particular symptom it, it you know medics somewhere will have tried it to try and improve patients lives so if they haven't been properly tested i you know i always ex exercise extreme caution because you just don't you're in the realms of the unknown um and, but I, under, I understand the desperation sometimes to try lots of different things because mm -hmm. we know that traditional medicine doesn't have all the answers. So we fully yeah. understand that, that. In terms of if you're having numbness mm -hmm. and you have autoimmune disease, make sure you get your B12 checked, okay? So uh, vitamin B12 deficiency is associated with numbness, tingling, altered sensations, particularly in the lower limbs, um, mm -hmm. sometimes fingers and toes as well. Um, so, so certainly make sure you have your, vit your vitamin B12 level checked because pernicious anemia, which is another autoimmune condition, mm -hmm. can coexist yeah. with PBC. So really yeah. important you get that checked. Um, in terms of, was it, was it uh, unable to lose weight or was, was Can lose weight? Weight? Yeah, I was wondering about blood sugars as well, Andrew, that yeah. this person might yeah. like to. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the other thing in terms of that is that, um, inability to lose weight can be associated with thyroid disorders and thyroid disorders can be associated with, uh, with sensory disturbances. So checking that the thyroid is not underactive and thyroid disorders are autoimmune conditions and people with PBC quite commonly have a second, sometimes even a third uh coexisting mm -hmm. autoimmune disorder um as colette's already said diabetes can also lead to sensory disturbances mm -hmm. um and in some people it's not because it's weight loss but in some people it causes weight gain as well so it's worthwhile having a bit of a bit of a blood workup i think with your yeah. with your gp in the first instance um mm -hmm. and and checking on simple things like your blood sugar checking on your vitamin b12 levels your thyroid function uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you know all the all the hormone mm -hmm. systems are working accurately for you um, yeah. And then obviously, if there's ongoing numbness, dis despite those tests being normal, that, that, that might require further evaluation to make sure there's not another cause. Yeah, I think it's important to comment as well, isn't it? Although we get PBC and dry eyes and dry mice, we do get other things as well. <laughs> yeah. And um, so not to rule them out, not don't blame everything on your PBC. But, you know, if you get, if we can help me any further, do, please do phone me at that person. You'll get my my personal number if you phone the office, my my uh, mobile number's on the, the answer machine. Right, this one's going to test my eyesight, I tell you. I can't get an appointment with the optician until the end of next month. My fibre scan numbers were 6.6. EKPA. <laughs> Yep. And 241 cap D. I yep. can't read that. What can you tell me about that? Okay. Uh, good and good. Uh, so, so fibro scan measures liver stiffness, okay? And one way of measuring stiffness in science is to use a measurement of pressure, which is kilopascals. And that's what KPA stands for. Oh, right. So, okay. so, so yeah. anything less less than eight is, um, is, is you know, good in terms of... Uh, presence of fibrosis or scar tissue and actually in pbc the readings tend to be higher than they are for lots of other diseases because with the when bile tends to accumulate in the liver the liver gets a bit stiffer than it does in other conditions so a fibro scan reading of 6.6 i think it was um I'd, I'd be very happy with that when i'm consulting with somebody with pbc so that's not suggesting any evidence of of, of you know of 
uh, significant scar tissue that's really positive the cap measure measures the amount of steatosis or fat within the liver um mm -hmm. and um pretty sure that the threshold for that is about 280 so below that means that there's minimal fat in the liver as well so generally speaking those are those are both very very positive readings Excellent. The, the more important one is definitely the kpa reading okay because some people have a fair amount of fat in the liver but if the liver's not stiff and hard and it's not fibrosed that is not as important as it as if the liver is hard and stiff uh with fibrosis so uh you know i'd certainly be very satisfied with those readings for you and is, is it worth mentioning as well i know um, i found it just by accident some people not having fibrous cancer their actual liver units <laughs> and they're getting something called the elf test which i'm told yeah. is a very expensive hundred pounds a pot blood test which uh, does it do the same job is it is as yeah. efficient yeah so i think um what's interesting i mean there's lots of different technologies to sort of non-invasively assess how scarred or stiff your liver is um, mm -hmm. They work in very, very different ways. Um, so the fiber scan measures the hardness of the liver by it literally sends a vibration wave through the liver. Those who've had it will have, feel, mm -hmm. have felt that little vibrational thud. And then it's very clever. It sends a little ultrasound wave chasing after mm -hmm. the vibration and it works out how, how long it takes for the ultrasound beam to catch up with the vibration wave. And it uses wow. that that property to to measure how hard the liver is so a hard liver will transmit the vibration faster than a soft liver so it's a very clever bit of kit so it mm -hmm. measures hardness the elf test uses biological markers or chemicals that mm -hmm. are secreted or produced by the body in response to, to to inflammation and scar tissue so when your liver is producing scar tissue it secretes certain chemicals that we measure and that's what forms the elf test so it's using different, completely different technologies to try and measure the same thing. Wow. Now, it's very hard to directly correlate uh, a fibrous scan reading to an ELF score. Oh, wow. But what there are, there are thresholds. OK, so what will happen is, is that when I said about when we're using fibrous scan, anything less than eight, we're not too worried about. OK, oh. and with ELF scores, it's usually around anything less than 9.5. We're not so worried about. So we use the thresholds to rule it out okay um so they are both validated properly mm -hmm. tested um they've been measured against liver biopsies so they're both they're both useful but it's mm -hmm. not that easy at the moment to directly compare one with the other yeah yeah exactly. but it's then about access what your local service has and it doesn't really matter which one you use because they are both good at telling you if you've got lots of scar tissue or if you've got none OK, yeah, and, cool. yeah, yeah. Excellent. so so both those tests perform very, very well at saying, yes, yeah. there's no scarring or yes, there's lots of scarring yeah. where both the yeah. tests have limitations is in the middle. OK, yeah. so if yeah. it's a low reading and there's no scar tissue, great. If it's really high, we can be confident there's scar tissue, but there's always a middle ground where yeah. in fiber scan, it can be elevated because the liver is very fatty or if you've got mm -hmm. heart problems in elf test, if you've got other conditions, inflammatory conditions like uh, uh, psoriasis and arthritis that can put it up the, ah, there's, of course, okay yes, the, the, yeah. there's other sort of inflammatory conditions that can falsely put the put the elf test up yeah so so yeah. i think but then those readings tend to sit in the middle and that's up to the doctor um, then to try and differentiate what that means yeah but yeah. um yeah i think if you're having an elf, elf offered an elf test that's an entirely appropriate test to be used yeah. um just make sure they explain to you what the reading is and what that means for you that's that's very very good points that you raised. Now this um, somebody's come back to say thank you for the information about fasting for five percent five scan. I wasn't told this, and my result was higher this year. I had a baguette while waiting for my appointment, so my gut was probably working overtime. Lol. So do you think that baguette would have made a difference, Andrew? Yeah, it can do. It can do. And as I said, yeah. I think um, as I say, you know. For some people, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but but I've certainly seen people who've had um, unexpected rises in their fiber scan. So people we've been following up for a couple of years, it's always been five and then one day it's eight. Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, well, why is it changed to eight when it's always been five? You know, you think, well, has the liver got worse? Well, liver tests have been normal, you know, and you think, mm -hmm. well, there's not any really good reason. And, and so what we'll do in that situation is you just repeat it again in a couple of months. And as often as not it'll come back down and when i do a repeat in that situation i will always ask somebody to make sure that you're fasted because it can make a difference of uh sometimes 10 15 percent um sometimes 20 percent um depending on what sort of things you've had and uh and so so i think 
we probably need to be better at making it clear that it's that, that fasting yeah. is is useful yeah. it doesn't need to be an overnight fast just a couple of hours is, is usually mm. more than enough um because occasionally more more often than not it doesn't make a difference but occasionally you can get a reading that's slightly higher because you've had a meal well i think alan's listening into this <laughs> our man in the background alan we'll get that in the next bear facts let's remind people um, and we maybe have a wee list to what tests you should be fasting for. Shall we do that? Good. And the ox bile, the somebody's back is bile salts. I've asked some doctors, but I can't get an answer. Thank you for your answer. You're very welcome. I'm sorry we couldn't take uh, ox bile is a bile is bile salts. So so yeah. there you go. I mean, just to reiterate on that point, Colette, as just to remind that person that if this was not working for you, there are other licensed therapies available. That, yeah. that you have that you have every right to have access to and yeah. so uh, um, make sure you push for that do and don't come off your air so do not come off your air so at all keep with it that's an yeah. order from from she who can never be Dis <laughs> disobeyed but always, I, but always i learned that very early on <laughs> <laughs> listen i'm old you did your tilt <laughs> right i've been diagnosed with pre-diabetes so a nurse told me to cut out carbs I have not gone carb free, but very low carb, no bread, rice, pasta, or potatoes. Is it safe with PBC? I'm early stage cirrhosis with portal hypertension. Just, just, um, I'm, this is a good question for you, but uh, I would say to you this low carb thing, and where it's come about is from Michael Mosley, Dr. Mosley, whom I've actually met in Edinburgh and I've read his books. And, you know, he really has got a grip on this. Uh, my understanding from other doctors, he's got a grip on this. But um, I'm going to hand you hand this over to, to Andy, but I, I would say whatever it is you're doing, make sure your hepatologist, your liver person knows what it is, um, your your diet, et cetera. What's, what's your thoughts, Andy? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, one thing you will need if you have early portal hypertension is you will need uh, – more calories per day than most other people will because there's a risk that you'll develop muscle weakness so if you have cirrhosis a certain proportion of people will have muscle wasting um if you have portal hypertension some, an even higher proportion of people will have some muscle wa wasting if you have a uh, decompensated disease that's with ascites or hepatic encephalopathy then the risk of that happening is even higher. It can be as high as 70 80 percent of people with those complications will have muscle wasting and you will then need a much higher calorie intake than uh, somebody who is perfectly uh, healthy without liver disease. So you need to make sure you get the balance of your calories right in terms of the total number of calories per day. The other thing that will be critically important is to make sure that you are getting plenty of protein in your diet oh, rather yeah. than lots oh, of fat. Okay? Yeah. So um, what we find is, is that people with portal hypertension probably need one and a half to two times the amount of protein in their diet per day compared to somebody. So it would be useful to increase your calorie intake with lean protein as best you can. So fish, chicken, things exactly. like that. Exactly. Um, try to avoid red meat because you can't get the amount in um, with red meat. It's, it's a good source of protein, but just the, the, the amount you have to take is very, very high. And then there's a lot of fat with it as well. So, so yeah. certainly I think I understand the need to cut out the carbs from the pre-diabetes or diabetes point yeah. of view. There's a lot of logical sense in that. Yeah. But certainly... Uh, don't supplant it for the paleo diet with this really high in fat. That's not going to do you much good. It's mm -hmm. not going to be good calories for you. What your body's going to need is a really high source of protein. And the other mm -hmm. thing that's really, really helpful then is your is your movement is medicine bit, your, 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 your cans of beans, your cans of beans. Cans of beans, beans. Yeah, yes. beans. Um, So <laughs> incre inc increasingly just some form of resistance exercise, okay? Mm -hmm. Not a high intensity, anything that weighs half a kilo or a kilo, you know, mm -hmm. using your upper limbs and your lower limbs so that whatever extra protein you're using gets into the muscles. Because if you're not using the muscles, you, your body will just burn the protein up as an energy source rather than actually building your muscle strength back up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think the lower, lower carbs is fine as long as your total calorie in, intake is up. But mm -hmm. make up that difference with protein. But certainly speak to your local team about getting some specific dietary advice to make sure that your your calorie counting is right in terms mm -hmm. of have you got the right amount? Because... It, if you haven't got liver disease and portal hypertension, we would say to most people with prediabetes, lose weight and you make your blood sugars much, much better. Have a low calorie diet and that's good for you. But we need to find that right balance between making sure we're not starving your muscles of further protein 
um because that'll make you weaker and it'll, it'll deteriorate your quality of life so we need to make sure we get that balance right of the total number of calories and you need to increase your protein to do that I, I've no, I mean, no very little about this, and I wonder if you maybe think about doing something for the bare facts, um, because this is really important what you're saying, and uh, clearly this person didn't know, I didn't know, so let's perhaps we might think about that and put that on our list of, our wish list. I'm not going to ask you just now. But, but you know, it's really <laughs> encouraging to hear people talk about the fact they know they've got portal hypertension. Yeah. You know, you're clearly yeah. very engaged in your care, which is great, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, that makes conversations about the next things to do in terms of treatment so much easier because yeah. you've got that good level of understanding. So, yeah. so that's, yeah. so that it, it, it's, you know, it's no, great. It's, good. it's yeah. good. Um, so you've answered the question, <clears throat> the elf and fiber scan. Yeah. So my fiber was 19 and my L 4.5, no explanation, just read it in a letter. Oh, that's a bit rubbish, isn't mm. it? Yes, it's it's not ideal, uh, shall we say. Um, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you don't, you can't get into in-depth in a letter. You can give general themes. So, you know, generally, if, I, if I'm writing to somebody so they get the information back quickly, um, but not to panic people, you know, you need to sort of at least give a qualifier what it means yeah. and, and, and next steps. So, you know, yes, 19 is higher, um, but that needs to be interpreted in the context yeah. of what else they know about you. Um, yeah. If you haven't had a, an ultrasound recently, I think it would be useful for you to have one uh, fairly soon and that you can go back to the that team and ask them about that so to just to look to see if the spleen's enlarged, things like that. Yeah. We find readings of 19 sometimes in people with PBC whose ALK-FOS is very, very high as well. And sometimes yeah. if the ALK-FOS comes down, that can improve a little bit. But yeah. certainly um, it's not helpful to just put uh, two readings and leave everything up to you to interpret. So I would ask for some clarification about what that means for you in terms of uh, treatment, both now and in the future. Um, what monitoring needs to be in place to keep an eye on your liver condition, next reviews. Um, and a conversation about it in more depth, I think, is, is important for you. And I would put it in writing. Um, yeah. They won't ignore a, a letter yeah. and an email, so please do put it in writing. Um, next question, I'm on Ocaliva, five milligrams daily. I was advised to continue with Urso. Is this normal protocol, although I was told that Urso isn't working? Good question. You've already partly answered it, Colette. Um, I know. The, an keep, the, an keep the answer is. I can't tell her why. I can know. I'm sorry, I assume it's there. I, I can't tell her why, but yes, keep taking it. You, you're yeah. going to tell them why. Yeah. So, so Urso is very much the bedrock of treatment for PVC. We've been using it for 30 odd years now, I think, or a, quite no, no, a long no, no, time. No. 20, because I was like 20 years. 27 yeah, 20 years ago. Years. 25, yeah. I think, 25. Yeah, so quite a long time, you know. I've only been a doctor 23, Colette, so, so before oh, my time. Oh, bitchy, uh, give me that bottle of sauce <laughs> in the milk. <laughs> um, so, um, so we use it because we know it works, okay? But it doesn't work for everybody. But even in, the, in those who don't have a complete response to it, so most people have a partial response. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Urso and uh, beta colic acid work in different ways. They work on different biological pathways and systems and so they are complementary so mm -hmm. we want the OCA to work in one way and the OCA mm -hmm. works in a slightly different way so they are important to be used together now in the the original um, um, OCA trial on which you got licensed for use in PBC the vast majority of patients were all taking OCA as well so there's what we call probably a synergistic effect so, you know it's, it's a multiplicative effect rather than an additive it's not that you get a 10% benefit from one and another 10% from the other. Use them together, you often get a multiplier effect and they work in different ways. So it's very important you take both together. The only ex exception to that would be if you've got horrendous symptoms related to that. But actually the proportion of people who are truly intolerant to it, so when you reduce the dose and escalate back up again is actually very, very small indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah good answer. I'll remember the answer, okay? Now this person <laughs> comes back and I was actually gonna raise this. What about protein powder in, in food? and shakes i think yep. this is to do with yeah, the yep. portal absolutely yeah. so in terms of the protein intake you require as i say you often need 1.5 to 2 grams of protein per day if you've got portal hypertension that's a mm -hmm. lot of protein that's that's like five steaks a day or six steaks a day and often people do struggle to ingest that amount in um in the supplements and so the powders are a good way of um of supplementing that which can be put on food 
not that palatable the powders generally speaking mm -hmm. so there are uh there's pro source jellies so that those have got more, more protein in them and there's little shots you can get now called renapro and those seem to be a little more, bit more palatable than the powders so there's a number of different uh, delivery systems for the protein supplementation um and so if you're finding, finding the, the powders not that great and you know, springing a powder on your food isn't particularly attractive unless you're a, a bodybuilder. Um, then, then, you know, so if you find that difficult, then, then then speak to your team about maybe getting some different preparation because there are several different ones. Yeah. But yeah, they're very important for some people to keep yeah. that protein and tick up. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea. Um, Fiona Hood says, Colette, you're cracking me up with your excitement for beans. I love beans, all of them. <laughs> that can't be the rest. She says it's the case that all the more variety, the better. Well, I'm glad you love your beans. <laughs> I'm glad I'm amusing you. Um, I've been given just now, I've been given a, a second question, a question for a second time. Um, gosh. Thank you so much for the answers about pre-diabetes. I am eating the lentil pulses and chicken. Also nothing processed and full fat Greek yogurt with berries. My body is shrinking. So please about that, excellent. But I have a telephone appointment on Monday with my brilliant hepatologist, who I won't say his name. So we'll see what he says. Thank you again and a couple of kisses there. For That's me, it. obviously. Yeah, um, but that that that's excellent. That's good. That's what we like to hear. This is all just frozen on me. So just um, a PBC and NAFOLD. You're not alone. What is the best diet for me? And, and we can just say to people what NAFOLD is. And and also, um, I would say to you, th this terrible time we've all had in the last eighteen months. This has become more and more common a story. But I'll I'll hand to you. I'll defer to you. Yeah, so, so, so NAFL is non alkylated fatty liver disease. It's the accumulation of fat within the liver. Um, and that is, um, it's a very common thing. So about 30 to 35% of the adult population will have some degree of fat in their liver. Um, and for some people that can cause harm, whether you have PVC or not. If you have PVC um, and a fatty liver, it doesn't say it'll be the case for everybody, but it can in some people accelerate you know the, the speed of the you know uh, scar tissue within the liver and so we need to be sort of a little bit careful with that so we don't really want a lot of fat in the liver as well as pbc because that could accelerate the rate of the liver disease mm -hmm. in terms of uh, treatments for that then then in most people unless you've got advanced liver disease and, and portal hypertension then then it would be as we were talking about the pre-diabetes side of things weight reduction so we know that weight loss of between 7 and 10% of your current weight will lead to a significant reduction in the amount of fat within your liver. And that will make the liver healthier as a consequence. Mm -hmm. So um, the same proportion of weight loss, 7 to 10%, is what's recommended for diabetes avoidance in people with prediabetes as well. So it sounds a lot, but actually for most people who are overweight, that can often mean you know three quarters of a stone a stone. Um, you know, something just, just over a stone in, in weight loss. And it's always recommended to do that slowly rather than suddenly. I'm not a big fan of these crash diets. That can actually mm -hmm. make fatty liver worse, believe it or not. If you lose weight suddenly, the liver can temporarily get more fatty. So think of doing some small changes, increase your, your, your degree of physical exercise through small movements, get your cans of beans out. Um, think about your portion sizes and just reduce your calorie intake that way around, reduce mm -hmm. the carbs down. Um, and, and that's a good way of doing it slow and steady to achieve yeah. around seven to ten percent uh, weight loss to just make your liver that little bit healthier and prevent progression of your PBC. That's excellent. Now we haven't got any <laughs> questions that that are filtering through to me because I know they've got a bit technical difficult in the background. We've got a wee gap, and there's no question we're going to let you go. But before you go, um, Andrew, we get asked an awful lot about the vaccine. Yes. And, you know, James Newberg was very blunt. He said quite a few patients have asked him and his response has been, would you like me to take you around the ward to look at COVID patients? <laughs> you know, he's old, he can get away with that. But there's an awful lot, you know, there's an awful lot of um, things out there. And, there, you know, I, I noted in London, there was a, a doctor who'd been struck off some years ago for something to do with the, the MMR, that he was standing with a microphone, and a, a nurse who's been discredited by me, various family members. And I just, I, and I get lots of phone calls, not the thing, who, who do I believe? I, I get, 
you're a doctor, you went to medical school for all these years, you treat PBC patients, you will have a view which I think would be very helpful for people to listen to. Okay. So uh, I am double vaccinated. I'm very happy and proud to declare that. Um, all my family are eligible. My children are 13 and 12 and they've got an eight-year-old. As soon as they are eligible for vaccine, they'll be having the vaccine. Um, that's because I believe that the, the evidence is, is that they're overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly safe. There's a very rare, um, uh, uh, so the rate of serious side effects is very, very rare and actually is probably lower than the rate of those similar conditions occurring with COVID itself. In my own hospital at the moment, the vast majority of patients being admitted to hospital are unvaccinated. The vaccinated people that are getting admitted to hospital stay in for far less than those who are unvaccinated. So they're in for a day or so and then home. On our ICU, uh, virtually everybody is either very, very sick because they've had cancer treatment or, you know, within the near past or they're unvaccinated. We are seeing very, very few people vaccinated going to intensive care. If you look at the UK data, of oh, 50,000 deaths, sadly, been 50,000 deaths in the last 12 months, um, or since since the vaccine was available, rather, from COVID in, in the UK, only 252 of those were double vaccinated people. So so when you bear in mind that, was it 75 or 78% of the adult population has been vaccinated? So that's 50,000 people have died um, from COVID who were unvaccinated of a smaller proportion of the population than those who've been vaccinated of whom only 252 have died. There's also I good data. That quite distressing, Andrew, it, really distressing. It's, it, each one of those is a tragedy and avoidable. Yeah. Uh, almost all of them are avoidable. Um, and then if you look at hospital admissions data from England, again, the correlation between vaccination and admission uh, probability and, and actual numbers is huge. So if you're unvaccinated, you are multiples of times more likely to be admitted to hospital with COVID if you get it. So please, please, please get vaccinated. I, I, I think what you've said, it's had a massive impact on me and I'm and I'm on uh, being vaccinated. I've had, I got mine by mistake actually, because my husband was getting his done. So the soldiers did me as well. I think they were a bit scared. I do have another question, but I will tell you my 16 year old granddaughter, Robert's daughter on her phoned me up a couple of weeks ago, just to say, I'm Granny Collie, I've been vaccinated. I said, oh, have you now? And I, it's not up to me that she does or she doesn't. I said, oh, that's, that's grand. Were you okay? I was fine. She said, but you have to understand, I've got elderly grandparents. I said, watch it. <laughs> Cheeky me bits. Um, anyway, um, she's got COVID. She's got COVID. It's, our school's rife. So she had a headache for a few hours and she's she's bored. She's bored. She's, uh, she's fine. She's fine. So, um, but thank you, Andrew. Um, th that means a lot. This is very, very important, you know, and we, it comes up every week and I do like to hear people's take on it. The numbers are, are incredible, what you just said. Okay, so I think there might be more questions. I'll get on very quickly. I've started acquiring small bumps all over my tops and bottoms of my feet, up my ankles and legs, also on hands and fingers. They're hard and stick up. Is there anything you could think would be causing this? Um, I mean, usually, are, things, I mean, are, are they itchy? I mean, things that come up quite suddenly on arms and legs are commonly allergic reactions. It can be reaction to medications or, 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 or viruses or changes in washing powder, detergents, things like that. So um, particularly if they're in any way itchy or red, um, then, then an allergic type reaction is by far the most common thing. It's quite unusual to get hard lumps on, on the skin for other reasons in multiple areas, if I'm honest. But mm -hmm. certainly, if, if, you know, think about any changes you made in terms of new medication, including over the counter, I say new mm -hmm. detergents. And, and if, if it's persistent, then you, then you should get it checked over with your GP. And if they can't an answer what it is, then you might need to see a dermatologist. But um, I don't think it's likely to be related to your to your PBC. Some people, obviously, if you have a lot of pruritus, then you can get that prurigo, you know, those, those little yeah. raised areas which are very yeah. itchy. Um, but actually, this doesn't sound like what's being described here. Um, and so I, I would say, think about if anything changed that could represent an allergic reaction. But if it's persisting on, you may well need to see to see your GP about that or, or, or get some advice from them who can who can have a look at it. Okay, so we have a question. I've been told by doctors that it's no longer getting called shrine and it's no longer available. It is very difficult to, to get. I don't know if it's still available. Uh, she was given that question in the past and 
didn't feel it worked maybe the, the, you know not everybody's told the proper way to take it but anyway if you can't get it what else can take its place um when say that they, they want to up my refambicin but i don't want to do that so yeah so i mean so cholestyramine is kind of entry level treatment for pruritus in PBC. Um, some people we use oral antihistamines, although they're not fantastically effective. So rifampicin is one of the next uh, drugs we would tend to use. Um, in, in general, if, if you've tolerated the rifampicin at your current dose, you, you are likely tolerate it at a higher dose. Most of the rifampicin reactions are what we call idiosyncratic reactions, which is basically an unpredictable response whereby your immune system takes a dislike to the drug quite early on. And so the risk of, of getting additional side effects on a higher dose are actually pretty darn small. Um, mm. So that would m remain one option. But if th if that's not um, acceptable to you, which is a p perfectly you know personal choice to make, then there are other therapies that can be used. So that sometimes we use a drug called uh, naltrexone, which um, uh, which basically blocks morphine receptors in your skin which drive up itching um, and so that can be used in some people and, and sometimes we use a drug called sertraline which is used for um it's actually used for depression and anxiety but it but at, at lower doses initially can have uh, significant effects on itching for some people so there are other therapies available uh, mm -hmm. but but an increase in rifampicin would would still be a, a logical a logical um thing to do if you've tolerated it well so far but it would require all those things would require a discussion with your your local yeah. team, um, yeah. and your GP probably wouldn't feel comfortable or, or be familiar enough with the treatment of pruritus in in mm -hmm. PBC. So if you've got a friendly specialist nurse or uh, wait, you know, or, or approachable hospital team, get in touch with them and just say it, you're struggling with it. What else can you can can you can you suggest for me? Because there are other there are other options. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was diagnosed with PBC by my GP in early June. I still have not been seen by the hospital yet. Do I have to be worried? Yeah, I, it's it's always an anxious time when you've been told you've got a new condition, yeah. isn't it? And I, I think, um, you know, I, I think most people when they first diagnose with PBC, you know, the, the short term risk of, of anything bad happening to you is, is actually pretty small. Obviously, there can be lots of symptoms that don't necessarily correlate with how severe the underlying PBC is. So itching or fatigue can be completely independent you know it's not associated with the severity of the underlying disease so you might have lots of fatigue but actually it doesn't mean to say your liver disease is bad but ultimately of course you do need an assessment of that um mm -hmm. you know certainly um other things that can give us a sort of a, a crude assessment of severity are how high your alp is gives us a little bit of a clue in some people um younger people tend to have slightly more um, for want of a better phrase, uh, aggressive PBC or more inflammatory PBC with higher numbers. But ultimately, you, you will need that assessment uh, to, to determine what stage your PBC is at in terms of whether you've got significant scar tissue or not. Um, you need to get on to some treatment to see how you respond to URSO, assuming that your liver blood tests are abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very hard to sort of advise with uh, with, without any specific information, but if you've got some further information on your uh, on your bloods or anything like that, if you've had a scan or anything like that, I'm sure if you were happy to share them with Colette, Colette can share them with me offline, and we'd be happy to to provide a little bit of additional information in between. I think that's fair, Colette, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. If you go <laughs> on to the office, so one two one five five six six eight double one, you'll get my mobile number, and I and, and we can have a look at that for you. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to speed through this now because I know time's getting on. Uh, I've really been down about my stomach. I've always been on the heavy side, but not bad. Over the year, my stomach swells like I'm pregnant. I don't eat that much. I have IBS. I have regular ultrasounds. I don't have fluid or anything. I put on a stone since last year, obviously like everyone, but my tummy is still the same. I also have Sjogren's, Graves' disease, PBC, and renal tubular acidosis. Oh, Anyone else have this? You know? So renal tubal acidosis isn't a particularly common disorder. Um, uh, and I'm not going to comment anything on that because I don't know that much about it. <laughs> but, uh, um, but no, I think, um, so the question is about bloating, if I'm um, predominantly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think any, any chronic condition is associated with an increased probability of having IBS. Um, and particularly any condition that slows down your physical functioning. So Sjogren's will tend to slow you down if you're getting joint pains with that. Um, and particularly if you're on any painkillers, 
uh, for any joint symptoms, particularly if they're codeine or morphine related, or amitriptyline, which is a common drug to use, use for these sorts of things, will all have a negative effect on bowel function and slow it down. And what will happen is that will make you more prone to gas retention and bloating. Um, and so it's important to sort of um, understand that um, and to think about your, your bowel function. Um, think about whether you um, are emptying your bowels normally. And if not, you know, some laxative therapy can be really, really helpful to manage that because it's extremely common when you have chronic health conditions for your bowel function to go very, very slow. And that's by far the commonest cause of bloating. If we know from the scans there's no fluid there, that's great. But obviously you've got a symptom that still needs managing and it, it's almost certainly going to be related to your bowel function. Okay. And for the, the lady who was diagnosed by a GP, there's somebody just come on in the room here to say, I phone the department to see what's going on. They're normally very helpful and may help push things along. Yeah, don't Correct. sit and wait. Yeah. You've got to go and get things in life. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, haven't you done well? I think you go to the top of the class. I would keep up the hepatology. I think you might uh, be the winner there. It's got legs. <laughs> And I know this has been a bit stressful for you. And no, at the end of a day's work, I was a bit shocked to hear some of your patients didn't turn up. I wasn't very happy about that. So I'm, I'm going to be having a moan and a nag in the bare facts. That's not on. That's absolutely not on. Um, if you can't go, you bloody well phone. Um, but Andrew, thank you so, so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Okay. It's been good fun. And uh, somebody saying on screen, I was moaning from America. Thank you very much. Very important to help. I look forward to sessions. Have a great day, everyone. Louisiana. Now, next week, friends, we have Dr. Do you know Bob Geish, Robert Geish, Andrew? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, only by reputation, but what a reputation. I'll tell you, a lovely week for stories. He's coming to Edinburgh. He wants to meet me some years ago. Um, he said, let's walk and talk. I said, well, I'll do a five miler with my wee Welsh dog who's got wee, wee, wee legs. And he said, that's fine. I'll meet you. He didn't. His flight was delayed. So I did the walk on my own or with friends. And he contacted me. No, I'm here. I said, well, I've done the walk. He says, we'll do it again. I said, no, listen, I've got PBC and my dog's got little legs. And he said to me, I'm a doctor. I can look after PBC. He says, your dog's tired. Your little Welsh dog, I'll carry her. I've got a photograph of Bob Geese carrying my dog. <laughs> He's marvellous. So Bob's next week in the, uh, from the States, two o'clock. Andy, brilliant, thank you. Alan, my wee man, how are you? Did you well, know? apart from a few tech difficulties, I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> The, the perils of modern technology, but uh, yeah. no, once again, a very interesting and informative session. I'm sure everybody who attended and listened in must have enjoyed it. Andrew, thank you very much. It's nice to put a, a voice to the face, shall I say. Yeah, <laughs> likewise, likewise, Alan. Likewise. You know, so, uh, yeah. He we'll does my hubby, you know, my hubby. And he's been away since he was, what, oh, 2018, 1920, something Well, I'll, I'll just use one of my favourite words to describe it. Brilliant. <laughs> Scott Ashwood. Right. Good night, Kimbell. I'm on holiday next week, but I will be here for the, the Thursday. And uh, all the best. Thanks, Andy.